Disabilities yeah. panel. It's uh, co-sponsored by both Level and Special Olympics. Uh, my name is Alex Cornell, and I would like to start by thanking our panelists for being here tonight, and I'd also like to thank you for coming out. Uh, it's really exciting, really excited to be here. Hope you're as excited as I am. Uh, I'm a junior mechanical engineer from Jacksonville, Florida, and I have the honor of not only hosting this event tonight, but I also am a part of both Level and Special Olympics. Um, a, little bit, a little bit about my involvement with Lovell. I'm the current Vice President and I've been involved with Lovell since its beginning this last year. And a little bit of how I got involved, um, two springs ago, I was fortunate to be in a group with Ari Meltzer-Bruin, with Greg Hanna and uh, Carly Edwards. And we'd been paired for the whole day and we were working and at the end of the night, Ari came up to us and she was telling us about this idea that she had to create Level. She wanted to create a group that anyone, no matter what your ability is, could participate in it and that they could be an integral member. Um, I, uh, excuse me. Um, the model that we live by is leveling the playing field. Um, Level is not only a socially based group, but we're also academically focused. Uh, we assist students by going into class with them and helping them take notes or uh, helping them write assignments or papers. Um, and one of the cool fun facts that we have is we estimated that we spent over 7,000 hours working with students um, to get, get their work done. Um, and it's just amazing that like, our group has dedicated so much time and so much effort to helping these students. Um, another cool thing, we hosted a casino night in the spring and we raised several thousands of dollars and that's amazing for a first year group. Um, we're going to be hosting it again this year and we're so excited to up the stakes and see where things can go. Um, we hope that with our group that we can raise awareness about students on our campus with disabilities and also raise awareness about ableism, which is the discrimination towards people with disabilities. So the purpose of tonight's um, panel is to both engage both Villanovans and non-Villanovans um, with their experience, either through Special Olympics or through Level, um, their interaction with someone with a disability, or even if they have a physical disability themselves. Um, we'll all have the panelists who introduce themselves, um, talk about their experience, um, and then we'll have some Q&A after that. Um, so I'm going to start with Liz, and then I'll explain with what our Q&A is and how it's going to go.
Sharon was a supervisor for the EMEA unit and a multiple reading specialist. But I really believe that Elizabeth was given, given to me as a gift to round out my education because I learned a whole lot more from her than I ever learned in any of my classes. Um, in Special Olympics, I'm a mentor for Elizabeth as a global messenger and as an athlete representative <coughs> for the management team. And I'm the family coordinator for the, on the management team in Delaware County. Elizabeth is the second of our three children. Her older sister is an attorney in um, Washington, D.C., working for the Department of Education. And her brother is the president of a real estate investment company in San Francisco. So you can imagine how difficult it was for Lizzie growing up in the middle of these two bookends. Both of her siblings wrote their college essays about their inspirational sister. Lizzie's sister and brother were both uh, gifted in, as, as students and as athletes. And they didn't have to work very hard to be successful. But Lizzie had to work hard to do everything just to become as normal a kid as possible. She didn't walk until she was two and a half. She had eye surgery before she was three to um, even out and imbalance in the muscles in her eyes. She had terrible balance. She had a short attention span, so we could never sit down and read a book as a family because we would be out of there by the first, by the first, uh, by the first page. She was very late in talking. And she also couldn't use language very well. She didn't understand language very well. As, I, as she mentioned, they even had to teach her how to chew and swallow. But for most people, you, when you put the food in your mouth, it's a reflex, and it starts, you chew. You know when to evacuate the food. Lizzie didn't have that feeling in her mouth, so she would put too much food in her mouth and then spit it out or choke. Or it was pretty, pretty gross. But we had to go through this facial therapy teach her how to chew and how to swallow properly. This beautiful young lady that's sitting next to me now is certainly a far cry from what we expected when we got her diagnosis at age three, which I might add we had to beg doctors to help us find out what was wrong. As a special ed teacher and somebody who was trained in child development, I knew from, from the time she was an infant that there was a problem. But I had to beg people to help me to find the answers to what was really wrong with her. But she has so far exceeded any, any expectations of any of the doctors had when they told us her diagnosis. All they ever really told us was the things that she never was able to do. But she actually has achieved way more goals. When she told us she would never ride a bike, and when she learned how to ride a bike, we took her bike to the hospital and let her ride it on the hall just to show the doctors that she could do it. <laughs> and they said, how'd she get that? How'd you get her to do that? And it was all because she was just so perseverant about everything. Uh, when she was little, her brother, who was also 21 months younger than she is, one time he made the comment that he hated having handicapped sister because she couldn't even catch a ball. And the next morning, about 6 o'clock in the morning, we heard this bounce, bounce, bounce in the driveway. And my husband and I looked out, and there's Lizzie in her nightgown, practicing, bouncing the ball and catching the other brother would never say that about her again. Her, her mantra when she was a little kid, and even now, is I can do this thing. So all you have to do is tell her that she can't do something, and she can do it. Hi, my name is AJ Corliss, and I'm happy to be with you. I work full time, and I play Special Olympic, bocce, basketball, bowling, tennis, softball, and ice hockey. Hi, I'm AJ's mom, Joanne Corliss. As you can tell, I've been around most of the time taking AJ to a special Olympic sport. He's <laughs> <laughs> a very busy young man. Um, I am a uh, 1982, I want to say 92, but it's not 92, it's 82, graduate of Villanova in their nursing program. I spent about 18 years working as a pediatric oncology nurse and a rehab nurse. And then AJ was diagnosed at about the age of two. Um, the doctors told us at that time, this was the early 90s, he was diagnosed with autism, and they told us at that time 
that um, to take AJ home and to find an institution for him. Um, it's really hard for me to say that because I think of him now, he's such a productive member of our community. But at that time, they really motivated us to um, start our whole um, journey for, uh, to, to advocate for him. So by the time he was about 10 years old, I think I gave up my nursing career and I became, became the president of the AHA Foundation for Children with Autism. And in September of 2000, the AHA Foundation started a private school called the Comprehensive Learning Center. It was the only school of its kind in Bucks County. Um, and it's been open now for 12 years. AJ graduated from it about two years ago. They worked with AJ and trained him, and he currently works full time, and um, it's very productive in our community now. So um, it's, we're really proud of him. Um, AJ and our family have been a part of Special Olympics for about 15 years. Um, my husband was a coach for a while. AJ's two sisters were, oops. I thought it went out. <laughs> Sorry. His two sisters are both unified partners. Um, unified partner is a typical athlete that competes along with the Special Olympic athlete. Um, so it's been a really great experience for them. Currently, I've participated as a coach. I'm also AJ's unified partner in Bocce. Uh, last year, AJ and I participated in the Bocce tournament here at Fall Festival. And we had a great time. Um, we haven't heard yet if we um, made one of the slots yet for this year. We're really hoping because we'd love to come back and see you all here. So thanks for having us here tonight. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Steve McWilliams, and uh, I've been the disability advisor here for the last 20 years or so. Uh, they said tell a little story. Uh, I consider this a celebration tonight because I, when I started this uh, journey about 20 years ago, it was an accident. Um, the president at the time was Father Dobbin, <clears throat> and the ADA had been passed, and we had a handful of disabled people, and, uh, uh, and he said, uh, you look like a nice guy, you, you'd be good at just taking care of the disabled people. And uh, I said, oh yeah, yeah, okay. How long? He said, uh, a couple months till I decide what I'm gonna do. We need, to, we need to put this through for, I guess, accreditation. I don't know what his motivation was, but we needed a disability advisor. So I said yes, and uh, 20 years later, I think he's on a, a villa in Tuscany, and I'm still the disability <laughs> advisor. Uh, and when I started, uh, and Helen Lafferty uh, is here, and, and Steve Sheridan, uh, both get shout outs, who really were instrumental in, uh, in getting this thing going. But when we started, uh, this campus was not hospitable to disabled people at all. As a matter of fact, for 10 years, I was a disability advisor, and I was in, my office was in the basement of Core Hall, and no student could come see me. And the response was, well, go meet them for coffee or something and find out what's on there. Go to their rooms. So the awareness here was almost nil. There were no ramps. There were no special access doors. It was pretty much an inhospitable place for anybody living with a disability. And today, um, we have an incredibly uh, accessible campus, and we have a humongous, uh, support group, staff, faculty. Uh, we have all these students here tonight. We have a level group, and I heard 7,000 hours or whatever that number was. That's amazing uh, where we've come and where we were. And it's all, um, and it's just a, a simple, small movement that has taken hold here. And uh, I've been really blessed to have uh, Greg come on uh, on his staff a couple years ago. He's made a big difference. And uh, so we've really, really made some great accomplishments. So the news is really good here. Uh, still, we still have ways to go, and I think as a society we have ways to go. But at Villanova, I think the news is really good, and I'm just really happy to see all you here, and I thank you for being here and listening. And I thank uh, I think it's a great partnership between Level and Special Olympics. And I really want to thank Ari. Is Ari here is somewhere? Stand up, where is she? Is she here? Hmm? Actually, oh, she's home. Okay, but she's uh, if you don't know Ariana Melsa Braun. Uh, there's a girl that just came out of the woodwork one day and said, I want to do something significant. And she creates this organization. And two years later, it's, it's a dynamic organization. And it's just because of a, an impulse of kindness. So I guess the lesson is that, you know, I basically said yes to something that I, it just came in my lap and I've been, I made a life vocation out of it. And it was kind of a throwaway moment. And I think Ari probably would say the same thing. So the, the news is, I think the lesson, if I had one to depart, to, you know, to impart to you tonight is, is that if you get the opportunity, don't say no, because uh, that road that uh, is waiting for you is pretty exciting. 
So I'll pass them to my buddy Greg here. Next time, let me go before Steve, all right? Was I too long? He said everything I've heard. Was I too long? Check, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Gregory Hanna. I am from, uh, originally from Monmouth County, New Jersey, grew up in Manasquan, uh, did my undergraduate degree at Monmouth University, and was uh, training towards being a high school teacher. Um, originally thought about law school, um, but it got, got away from that and just thought about teaching and coaching, and then I got away from teaching and wanted to get into counseling, and came away from counseling and started to work directly with students with disabilities when I first met Frankie, the guy who you're going to meet after me. Um, long story short, I taught Frankie all through high school. Frankie came to Villanova for a visit with Steve and Dr. Lafferty and I met Steve and after meeting Steve he asked me to come here. Um, I had just gotten married, just bought my first house and was getting ready to kind of live the next phase of my life post Frankie. Um, but the challenge that was presented to me and the opportunity to come to this university and to work with Steve was some, is the reason why I'm here. Um, so now four years later I'm here as the academic advisor to all of our students with disabilities and the advisor member for level and it's just been an, an awesome time um, without Steve uh, I probably wouldn't be here and without Frankie I certainly wouldn't be here um, again like Steve just said I think this is a great night for the university um, and a big thing too is one of my things and we'll talk about it later is, is the fact that the Office of Disability Services and that Special Olympics could sit at the same table and talk about what our mission is you're going to see that our mission blends and also the fact that people from Special Olympics can also see that although the festival takes place here at Villanova, that when the festival leaves here, there's still people here that still take the values that Special Olympics preaches, and we try to do it for our students here as well. So it's, it's nice and an honor for us to be here with you guys to share that with you as well. Is anybody keeping time? Is any longer than that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello. My name is Frank Kennedy, and I am in my fourth year here at Villanova University. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight, and it is great to be around people that have an interest in awareness and advocacy around this topic of disabilities. Well, hello, I am uh, Professor Mark Wilson. I'm a professor in the ethics program here. Uh, I am the equivalent of the replacement NFL referee for the evening. <laughs> so I am hoping that most of you are Seahawks fans <laughs> and not Green Bay Packers fans. I am only here because Greg has shown faith in me and entrusted me uh, enough to channel some of the students from his program into my classes. And so I've had the privilege of teaching Frankie, among others. And I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm awed by the number of students that are here. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see a standing room only crowd and to see that your uh, priorities are in the right place. So welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Bokman. I'm currently a junior. Uh, I'm a student here studying global interdisciplinary studies, philosophy, Japanese, with a specialization in virtual epistemology and literary translation. And yes, I'm going to quiz you on that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, to give you a little bit of brief history on me, I was actually a transfer student. I came in from another university, uh, Franklin and Marshall College, before this past semester. So I had the distinct pleasure of seeing um, disability services at multiple institutions. A brief introduction to my disability would be, I was born 16 weeks early, and I had a host of conditions. Perhaps the most recognized, or rather the most severe, was not recognized until I was around eight years old. Uh, I found out I have a condition called a mammal pectonosis of normal branching enzyme, which is a rare way of, a way of saying a rare condition that's basically a degenerative muscle condition, putting me from fairly average, still able to walk, uh, mostly through my teenage years, to a wheelchair with no idea where things are going to go in the modern day. Um, all types of other consequences, including a heart transplant at age 10, and, uh, well, my health has been more than affected. But I, uh, I'm here tonight to speak to Villanova's excellent 
care of its students with disabilities in the way that the institution has um, really shown to me, just as a transfer student, and proven to be one of the latest communities I've ever been in, if not the. So I guess if I had to put a message to put out to them tonight and say one thing, it would be um, focus on the community that you have here and what we can do and how we can integrate um, into a meaningful and functioning community as we already have. Awesome, thanks guys. Let's have a round of applause for you. Okay, so we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, what we ask you to do is, um, once you're called upon, just state your name. Um, you can either ask a particular panelist, you can ask an individual panelist if you want, or you can direct a question directly to the whole panel. Um, and then if one of the panelists has asked a question, if you find that there's a comment that you want to add on, feel free to. I'm going to allow for time to um, have that, and uh, we'll go from there. So we, we can have our first question. Becca. My name is Rebecca Simone. I'm a sophomore here, originally from Long Island, New York. And AJ, I was wondering, why did you participate in the Special Olympics? Because I get to meet a lot of people. I get to hang out with my friends and travel with my friends. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Hi, my name is Erin. Um, my question is for Mark Bookman. Um, I was wondering what the role of the student body uh, plays in the integration of um, disabled students in both social and academic life, and how Villanova students compare from the other university you attended. Sure. Um, the role of students integrating a, uh, a student into the Villanova community has been well, the quintessential role of doing so. Uh, Villanova students have the ability of inviting um, students with disabilities into their life and really creating an accepting environment that allows those students to really thrive. Um, to give you an idea, when I was at the the Marshall, the community was quite different from that of Villanova. The average student body, uh, rather the student body as a whole, was very introverted and isolated. Um, we didn't have communication on a personal level. With, even with your peers, and as a result of that, you would find very niche groups of students who would tend to play together for activities and wouldn't invite students who couldn't um, reach their location or would not go out of their way to do so. So you would find that disabled students often were left in the rooms with nothing to do and couldn't really function and thrive socially, and that would, of course, affect their academic life. Um, lack of a social life would just destroy an individual. Now, Villanova, on the other hand, has been the most accommodating institution I've ever been at in terms of clubs uh, and people that kind of go out of their way to meet with you. And really, the community as a whole has fostered a loving environment that allows for people to come together. Um, so the only, the only thing I can say for Villanova is keep doing it. I mean, put everyone together and make it so they have this loving relationship just acknowledge that we can involve people and we can get people to really thrive. And I think you'll find when you thrive socially, you can also thrive intellectually. So I guess that would be my answer. Uh, this question is for me, <coughs> Stephen Williams. Uh, what could Villanova do? Uh, what could Villanova do to promote more inclusion in the academic setting? For example, what do you hope to see from faculty and staff as the population of students with disabilities increases? Uh, well, to answer that, would uh, kind of presume that I had something important to say, and I'm an expert, and, and I told you I'm a volunteer. I think um, in just my, my, my limited experience, which is, isn't really that ex extensive, um, I think we, uh, we have a pretty inclusive environment. 
the law basically stipulates that you have to make accommodations and we don't really get any resistance from faculty. Uh, I would say the news is pretty good. There are probably 90% of the people that I deal with that are cooperative, helpful, inclusive. And the 10% that aren't, there's nothing that we're going to do to change that. That's always part of the culture. I, I, I mean, ideal, idealistically, you like to have 100%, but I'm pretty happy with 90. And I think that number's gone up. So I think the faculty in general and the staff are, are very helpful. Uh, I, I find people here to be extremely kind and generous. And uh, I think the only thing that I would probably hope, and this goes for all of us, uh, is that uh, it tends sometimes to uh, look at somebody who's different than us and kind of avoid them. And I think uh, that's a palpable feeling that people sense, that if you don't, uh, if you don't embrace them because they're different, I think, and, and idealistically or ideally, I, I would hope that, uh, uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, that we wouldn't assume like, I'm the disability guy. So for the longest time, that's why I'm so gratified to see all you here tonight. And, and so happy to have Greg working with me. Steve Sheridan, who's back here, can, can testify. For a long time, I was like the, quote, disabled guy. So if there was somebody with a disability, go see him. He's the disabled guy. If I didn't want to deal with him, call Steve. Like, I had some kind of magic potion that I was going to rub on the guy, you know, and make it all go away. Um, a lot of times these situations, as you can hear from the panel, these are, these are complex human problems and they require uh, a community response and that's why it's so nice to see everybody here uh, in, in kind of working together to uh, ensure fairness and justice and just in our own community here. So, I'm, uh, so I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, I'm, I just can't tell you how happy I am. I don't know if you, did, did you all have to be here for some reason? Did you have to write a paper or something? This is just on volunteers. I mean, it's just really gratifying to see you all here. And I, I can't say that uh, how much it means uh, because I, I just feel like I've come full circle. I went from, I went from almost like total apathy on this campus to this. It's like, uh, you know, Hosanna to all of you. Right? <laughs> Um, I have a question for Frank. Uh, Frank, how has level impacted your social life? I am honored to be here with all of you as you hear about a program that has had a major impact on my life here at Philadelphia University. When I arrived four years ago, like any other college freshman, I was nervous about how the academic and social aspect of my life were going to play out. I knew that I could always count on the amazing services that Greg Hanna and Stephen McWilliams and the Office of Disability Services could provide me with but I wanted to become a member of the student community and grow socially. Level has not only helped me academically, but has given me more social contacts and most importantly, lifelong friendships. Greg has built an amazing foundation for social awareness around this campus and students like members of Level have built something special. Students in Level get to learn about our students here living with a disability, but they also get a group that sets out to have fun, build relationships and hopefully with the ability to raise funds. Level will continue to be a group that will give other students the unforgettable moments that I have been here at Philadelphia University. And just to kind of add quick, if you look at what's kind of been said, so you look at what Mark said as a, as a transfer student coming in, and, and I remember meeting with, with Mark's family, and a, a major concern was the social aspect. Um, because Mark, as you hear when he gives you that resume of everything that he says, he's very accomplished. So coming in, mom and dad knew that he'd be able to handle the, the course load, but the big thing was the social piece. 
And listening to what Steve was just saying about what he was hoping for from faculty and staff over time, and you know, trying to create this more inclusive environment, you know, and then you listen to Frankie talk about what um, what Level has done for him, you know, it, it just kind of speaks to where we're going, but there's still more to go. And I, I think what for the students, the the big part in that whole piece is that. No matter what Steve and I do, Steve and I come to work every day regardless. We have a job to do, we have a job description, there's things that we need to do. Um, but we also know that in order for some of these things to be successful, for, for Mark to sit here and talk about how great the Villanova community is, it's because of the Villanova community, not just Steve and myself. When you hear Frankie talk about the amazing experiences that he took from Villanova, it wasn't just because of Steve and myself. It's, there's an office that exists for these guys to do the things that they need to do to get through college, but there's also these guys as people, and to hear them say that they're a part of this community. Um, I think that blends to the faculty piece as well, if you look at what Steve says. Now when um, Mark or Frankie are around their classmates and then they're raising issues or concerns to professors, when there's two or three students behind them showing support, that professor may be more than likely to hear as well too, because the students are the ones that we really need to work with first. Um, and also if you look around, there's other faculty members that are here as well that definitely speak to the message of what we're trying to deliver. So as you listen to everyone answer their questions, just try to think about the, the ties that you can make. And out of that one, you really can get some really good stuff. So um, really good stuff that you guys are offering. Thanks. I think right out of the gate, the big thing is going to be for Level to continue to grow and, and have new members to hear about what we're doing. Um, I just had this conversation with a student today. When we first, when Level first got started, the initial thing was to make sure that there was a foundation built in the sense where we just wanted to have a group on campus that maybe started to look at some of the issues that were taking place in the office, but also um, provide an instant social aspect where there was going to be a little bit more access to students um, and also for the ability for some of the students to gain an appreciation for what some of our students do from a work aspect. The way Mark does work is a lot different than the way Frank does work, a lot different than the way Steve did work when he was here in school and a lot different than the way some of our other students do. Um, but the thing there is, is now I think that the foundation for Level has been built. We need to take on new members, but we also need to start to um, have a little bit more dialogue about what those issues are. Um, I think now that that level sets up where we're able to learn about the group a little bit, we need to learn a little bit more about the members of the group and also try to find some of those social identities because the group is not just built because of someone like Frankie. Um, the group is built for everyone here because in some way, shape, or form, we look to try to identify with something. And the fact that this group is sets out to, yes, allow people that have a physical disability, know that they can come to an environment where if we need to plan events on campus or anything else, we're taking the accessibility options into effect first and foremost, but also that other people can learn what it's like to be around anybody with any kind of disability, even an able-bodied person can probably find some sort of thing that is troubling them that people can learn about. So I think we need to start, the next step for me is to really engage in some more social identity to really allow people to know not just what it's like to work with Frankie, but what Frankie has been doing his whole life and how he has coped with a lot of different things and how Mark and even when you look at AJ and the rest of the panel, they've all had to overcome and cope with certain things and the best way to do that is by actually engaging in conversation as a group and start to get some group dynamic because with that we'll be coming, will come how you 
work with them from an educational standpoint or how you can work with them in your business, all of your guys' majors in some way, shape, or form, you most likely will come across um, someone with uh, a disability. How many people even on a raise of hands have someone, a family, a friend, or anyone that they know that is living with some sort of disability? See, there's a lot of hands. So as a group, I think one way that we change that is to start engaging in a little bit more dialogue and um, inviting students that might not even be in level to really start talking about some of the things and really be comfortable to raise questions that um, people can answer. You know, I just add to that too, like, I haven't told Randy this, but the first time that I saw him, I didn't know where he was going, like, it didn't look, it looked like he was all over the place, had no direction, but then, like... You're, you're probably right about that. You're then, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> the next the time to get to know him, and we, I found that he shares the same love I have for baseball, and, like, that is just our deal, like, we love talking about baseball, and finding that one thing that... It's outside of whether Frankie can walk and play that game. We can share that passion and that love for baseball. And really just like, if you're willing to take the time to get to know these students, like they're so happy to get to know you. Like you're gonna love them for who you are and they're gonna love you for who you are. So I um, just like reiterate kind of what Greg is saying too, like, Take your time. Like, you guys can take a little bit of time to understand what Frankie's saying because it's going to take him two minutes to write it out. But you're going to learn that like it's not he's not pointing at a board. You're having a conversation with him. And you just get to that point where conversations just keep going and going. So um, don't be nervous. It's yeah, maybe nerve nerve wracking the first time, not knowing what to do. But take the time. And you're definitely going to enjoy your time. Being I just want to say one thing, uh, just real quick. Uh, I think that, that uh, something I've experienced is that I think people think uh, when they see you working with people with a disability that you're some kind of, you have some kind of special talent or some kind of special gene that you have. I, I don't have any incredible patience. I have no specialized knowledge. I, have, I know nothing about this. I, everything I learned was just by hanging around with the people that have gone through here. And I've learned just by association. And I, to, to respond to your question, I can, will there ever be a time when I don't see the chair? No, I always see the chair. I always see what the struggles that they have to go through just to get through what I take for granted. And I think that humility that I look on my own self of what I've been blessed with, that's, what's my, that's my fuel to do what I do, is that I've just been, I just got a great deck of cards. And, and I have an obligation uh, if I, go to this place or I live in this community to, to go and understand, you know, God wants me to do something. He's given me an ability. He didn't give me a special ability. He gave me eyes. He gave me a heart. And I think that's, and we all have that. We all have eyes. We all have a heart. So uh, I think the only thing I would, I don't think we'll ever get over the fact that disabled people are different and have special needs. That's why they call them students with special needs. It's our response to that. I think that makes us a special community, as Mark has pointed out. Um, I might have one more thing to that. I think it's precisely because we see the wheelchair, because we see the disability that allows for this community to exist, as he just said. I think that because we see the wheelchair, we have unique experiences that we bring to the table. We have unique perspectives that might not exist otherwise. And in creating and forging relationships on the basis of that, it allows for a greater exchange of knowledge than could ever possibly exist otherwise. So I think working, be, uh, working at the wheelchair and pretending like it doesn't exist is almost missing a point. It's precisely because we have these hardships and these experiences that allow for us to get along well with each other and really to foster a beautiful community. So I think that acknowledging it is something we have to do. And not, in, not just saying, oh, it's a hardship, but saying <coughs> what that hardship has brought amongst us in terms of personal growth and how we can influence each other in that regard. I, I would just like to add one more thing, and, and that is uh, having a daughter who is not in a wheelchair and who is not blind and is not wearing a hearing aid. I think it's equally important that you're not judgmental of people who don't react in the ways that you might expect them to react. A lot of people look at Elizabeth and assume that she's absolutely great, 
And then I start having a conversation with her, and I realize there's something different about this person. She, why is she talking about strawberry shortcake or something when she's an adult? That, that's not a really good example because she doesn't do that. That's why I was looking at her. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of the example we really need to pick up. But I think sometimes having the wheelchair, having having being a blind person with a cane or wearing a hearing aid, you sort of instantly have an empathy for people who look different. Uh, Down syndrome child looks different, so you know from the get go that there is an issue. But I think it's important that you also are open to the fact that people with dyslexia who can't write and who are having struggling taking their notes and people who don't answer you in a way that you would expect, that you have to be a little bit more tolerant of those people and be a little bit more understanding of the fact that maybe they have an issue and maybe I really need to, to think about that. I have a question for Joanne. Um, what do you think are some pointers to best communicate with someone with autism? Um, I think the first thing you want to do is get their attention and try to establish eye contact with them. Um, keep your communication really uh, simple. Most people with autism have aut auditory processing problems, so if you bombard them with a lot of information, they can't process it all. Also, um, people with autism are very literal. So if you um, use catchy phrases or idioms like um, it's raining cats and dogs, they're really going to think it's raining cats and dogs. So try to refrain from using those kind of phrases. Um, if you encounter a person with autism that's nonverbal, or really any person with a disability that's nonverbal, don't be hesitant to talk and communicate with them. Because um, a lot of people with disabilities that have no expressive language, meaning that they are nonverbal, they do have some recited language, meaning that they can understand some of the things that you're saying. So um, continue to talk to them. I like to tell people the rule of thumb is to treat them as you would one of your friends. Um, but just keep the communication simple and, and try to um, establish you know, um, eye contact with them. But besides that, I really wanted to comment on what everyone was talking about before. Um, thanks for the question. It just really warms my heart to hear the conversations that we're having because when I look out at um, a lot of you students and you all raised your hand, many of you that um, have encountered people with disabilities, I look at your generation as being the, um, the generation that's going to grow up, that has grown up and will work in, um, in, you know, when you get out of college, you'll work with people with disabilities because there are many, many companies now that hire people with disabilities. So just since, since AJ has graduated two years ago, um, I, I had told you before, he works in three different jobs. And the people that he has encountered in all three jobs, they're all young people like you. And it's just incredible the response that they have had towards AJ and how much they have accepted him. Um, he's very, very productive at these jobs. He does data processing and data entering for a um, research marketing firm and an accounting firm. He also works in a uh, food store fronting shelves. He moves the products up to the front of the shelves. So he's very productive in what he does. So they don't feel sorry for him and just get along with him. He, they really rely on him to do his job. But it really warms my heart to know how um, open you are to come here. You guys are really the ambassadors for our kids um, as they get older. Um, and when some of your friends encounter and watch you um, interact with people with disabilities, you're really a role model for them. Um, I remember my one daughter, my older daughter, she's a year younger than AJ, when she was entering into high school, she was really worried about meeting new friends and what they would think of AJ. And she asked me, you know, I don't know what to do. Do I tell people he has autism? Do I not? Sometimes some of the things he does may embarrass me. What do I do? And, I just said, just treat them like you would any other person, and you know maybe they'll learn from you. And, uh, and and she did. She took that advice, and she did. And she made a lot of friends in high school, and he made a lot of those friends because they all came to our house and they loved him, and they really learned by example from her. And that's what your friends are going to learn from you—the way you treat people with disabilities. 
they're going to learn that from you and they're going to think, hey, that's pretty cool, I can do that too. And uh, you'll find that they're very meaningful people, people with disabilities, you'll learn a lot from them and you'll really get a lot out of being with them. So thanks again for being here tonight. Uh, hi, my name's Will and um, I have a question for Dr. Wilson. Um, how about the experience that you have teaching students with disabilities? I'm just wondering, how is that affected? Uh, how do you do the teaching practice and the education system as a whole? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, first, if what is true for, for Steve is certainly true for me. I have no special training. I have no special talents. I have no special wisdom. Um, as Frankie can attest to. <laughs> you want to have a beer later? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say that challenges that we confront are, are much of what's been said already, right? It's primarily, in, in my experience, my own fear, my own presumptions, my own ignorance. I, I would be disingenuous if I said that when I walked in that first day and I saw Frankie, I didn't say, whoa, right? how's this going to work? But the truth is, I asked that question once to myself, and then through the efforts of Greg, through the efforts of Frankie, and through the tremendous labors and maturity on their part, it, it was seamless. It was truly seamless, and it has been seamless, whether it's been Frankie or other students from the Office of Disability. I think as teachers, you know, we walk into a classroom and we are blind to the limitations that students have, by and large. We're blind to the challenges that students face. And one of the benefits of the Office of Disability is it at least flags some of the limitations. And you have the maturity on the part of individuals like Frankie who can tell you, here are some of my limitations, something that many of the students without disabilities don't do and should do. And so I think in that sense, part of the reason the classes I've had with Frank and Nick and others have been some of the best classes that I've had is that they bring a transparency and an honesty about the challenges they face. And I think that can inspire others to confront their invisible challenges. I mean, yes, the chair doesn't disappear, right? But most of us live with invisible challenges and invisible difficulties and invisible disabilities. And part of the real gift that I think Frankie and others offer is an invitation right, to be honest with ourselves and to communicate and enter into community with, with our shared struggles.
I think you said it really well. I think that's a really tough um, question to ask, especially to moms. Um, I do know people that have had abortions when they have found out that their um, baby was disabled. Um, and one happened to be a very close friend of mine. It was a very difficult time for me because I had already lived through the, the shock and, and you know the, the acceptance of AJ having autism. And that was a really difficult time and it was hard for me to get over knowing that decision that she made. Um, honestly, I felt like it was a very selfish decision. But you know, you can't really judge people until you walk in their shoes, so, so the saying goes. Um, I do remember when I was 41, almost 41, I became pregnant, and um, my husband and I were very, very nervous about having another child with a disability. Um, I was high risk because I was older, um, and we went, we started to go through all the testing. Um, we had this appointment down at the University of Pennsylvania. And I think God just, um, he intervened that day for us because we woke up and there was a massive snowstorm. So Kirst, my daughter Kirsten and AJ were off from school then. They were two hours delayed. So we called down at University of Pennsylvania and told them we wouldn't be able to be there for a couple hours. And then they called us back and they were like, yeah, you're gonna have to go through all this blood work. You're gonna have to come back. There was just all this whole mix up. And we finally just called them back and said, you know what? Like, we're not gonna come. We both just looked at each other and said, even if we found out we had another baby with a disability, what would we do? We wouldn't end, end the pregnancy. We already live with one child, and he's been such a blessing to us. So um, we went through it. We, you know, we had a baby girl, and she's a monster, but we love her. <laughs> you know, she's typical. She's 12 now, but um, you know, I, that's just a, bit, that's a hard question. But, yeah. Good answer. Was it a good answer? Good answer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Reed Phillips. I have a question for Lily Suzanne. Um, I was just wondering how being involved with Special Olympics has and, excuse me, impacted both of your lives. Special Olympics has done a lot for me. I've had many, many opportunities. As an athlete, I have over 150 medals in seven different sports. I have run in the Georgia Dome and run in the Marine Corps Mini Marathon in Washington, D.C., where I came in first place twice. I have played soccer at Fall Festival for 20 years and at the World Games in, New in North Carolina. I have gone to Penn State for swimming many times in our last swimathon. I raised over $1,000 for our local program by swimming 220 laps without stopping. As a global messenger, I have spoken to thousands of people about special effects. I have even gone to the Washington, I've even gone to Washington, D.C. and met the congressmen to tell them how important special Olympics is to our athletes. As an athlete leader, I was on the steering committee for the first ever Athlete Congress in Pennsylvania. Special Olympics has given me places to go and people to meet. I have friends all over the state. Special Olympics has given me an exciting life. Uh, I would add to that the difference between Special Olympics and the doctors who told us everything that Elizabeth was never going to be able to do is that Special Olympics is about abilities and it's about possibilities. It's not about disabilities. And through Special Olympics, Elizabeth has, has created a network of friends. Um, as she said, she has an exciting life. I'm just trying to keep up with her. <laughs> but it's also helped her to develop a great sense of responsibility, a sense of teamwork. It's improved her social skills. It's, it's really been her teacher from from the time that she was a little girl. It's um, definitely improved her self-esteem. She has a very positive um, self-esteem. And without Special Olympics, Elizabeth would be a completely different person. I would be a couch potato. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but just imagine for yourself. Try if you if you have to close your eyes to visualize, you can do that. I always have trouble with that, but I just want you to imagine for a minute. Okay? What would your life be like? What would your life be like if you didn't have any sports? So you had no practices, you had no games, you had no teammates, you have no clubs, you have no musical groups. So you have no social interaction and you have no sense of purpose. You have no interaction with your peers and you have no way to develop your talents. Now think about not having school. You have no classes, no parties, no fun. You, you don't have a job. You have no money. You have no interaction with other people. And you have no feeling of independence. Now add to that the fact that you don't drive, you still live with your parents, and you lack the organizational skills and the language and social skills to call your friends on the phone and say, hey, you want to hang out? Or should we have a party or plan a road trip? You have none of those abilities. Now top that off with people calling you a retard and other names like that. This is the life that our Special Olympic athletes would have if they didn't have Special Olympics. So now I want you to think about this. Being in that same place, what do you think it feels like for a Special Olympic athlete to get on a bus with his friends, to stay in a hotel without his parents? And by the way, I may add, it's often the first time that athletes have ever been away from their parents, and the first time that the parents have ever had a weekend without their children. So there are some advantages to the parents as well. But they put on a uniform. <laughs> play a sport that they've been practicing for weeks. And they're cheered on by exciting and smiling college students. And they eat in the dining room hall. And they have people high-fiving them, high them that they don't even know and encouraging them to do their best. And imagine the wonder of spending time on a beautiful college campus with music and dancing and activities and in a community full of students and faculty members and staff members who welcome them and who celebrate their achievements. This is what Villanova Special Olympics provides for our athletes. It's fun, and any athlete will start off by saying, we have fun, we have friends, but it also is independence and purpose and pride. And I think above all, it's acceptance. And that's exactly what I heard from you know, Frankie from uh, Mark, that it's the acceptance of the Villanova community that is so important to our athletes. So my hat is off to every one of you, not only for your being here, which I think is just so important, but also for everything that you do for our athletes, because the parents appreciate it, and the athletes appreciate it more than you would ever know.
And it just hurts every time we go and boom. Because I get hold of that word and I tell my mom that I get hold of that word and she, she said to me that just don't worry about it and have, you know, tell them not to say it. And everybody says it all the time and it really hurts. So can you please, and I just want you guys to understand that being called retard is not a, a proper word to use in wherever you are, even on buses or at schools or at home, because it offends us and it just really hurts that we get called that all the time. And I've gotten called that so many times. Hi, I'm from Rachel, I'm a sophomore. Um, this question is for Frankie Warmark. Um, what is one experience in the Villanova community that's been kind of most helpful um, to kind of demonstrate the strength of the community, I guess, but that you'd like to see more of? One activity. One activity is quite hard to pick out. There's quite a few. It's something for me as simple as people walking by and saying hello. I mean, you don't think about what goes on in social interaction. You don't think what happens, what allows for acknowledgement of humanity. Um, part of the issue that I personally struggle with the majority of my life is uh, self-confidence and recognition. I felt like I was always um, pushed aside and frankly my self-esteem was terrible. Being a Villanova, the one thing that I've noticed is a distinct, you know, jovial nature. And the fact that even just when I'm wheeling the class, and those who have seen me will attest that I go quite fast, uh, even when I'm blazing past someone, <laughs> I still get a hello every now and then. And people go out of their way to <coughs> just be kind to you. Um, and I'm not saying we have to host special events. I'm not saying we have to um, essentially make this into a crusade, as it were. But to simply just be kind in passing, to say hello, to engage each other in a way that you would any, any other person. Um, again, it's just a core human relationship that's important. And go out of your way, even if it's just saying hi. You never know what will happen. <laughs> and then what, what Frankie was saying is similar to what Mark was saying. And, and the best way I can kind of put it together is, is the time when you guys, when you leave class or if you're going to any of the, like the dining halls or anything that you guys are doing in your busy schedule, a lot of times when you're passing students, you just say, you know, hey Joe, hey Mark, you know, hey Sue, what's up? And a lot of times people think that gets lost when they see, if they see Frank and you're like, oh, I, I can't stop because he's gonna start pounding on that thing and I might not get to class. Or, but, and usually he's gonna tell you something that you really don't wanna hear, and, you know, he might make fun of you, or if you're a woman, you might ask me to lunch, or if you're a guy, you might ask me to lunch too, so don't be nervous. Um, but what he's, what he's saying is, is just the, the ability to catch up, and that, and that means a lot, and that's one thing that we talked about too, even in high school, is you think about how fast paced we are, it's even faster here in Um and when people just take the time just to, to catch up with Frankie like anyone else, it means more to him than being in the course sometimes um, because that's really what he's, that's a small piece of what he's looking for on a daily basis. All right, thanks guys. I think we're gonna wrap up with that. Um, let's give our parents a round of applause.
um, and I've been helping to organize this panel along with Greg Hanna. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to start by thanking you, Alex, for hosting us tonight and for allowing everything to run so smoothly and for also to earn some insight of your own. Um, and also, of course, I really want to thank all of the panelists for everything that you had to say and for being so open and so helpful during this entire planning process. You made my job so much easier. Um, I think I speak for everyone here when I say that I learned a great deal from the stories and perspectives that you had to share with us. So thank you for being so willing to speak with us tonight. More specifically, I want to give a shout out to Greg Hanna, um, who has been helping me with this every step of the way. I feel like so often I would come to his office stressed out about something else that needs to be done, and in about five minutes he had everything figured out. Um, four of those minutes he spent making fun of me. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, um, finally, I want to thank all of you for coming out here tonight um, and for taking the initiative to hear what the panelists have to say. And so now my challenge to all of you is to take what you've learned here tonight and translate that into your actions, um, both on campus and, of course, outside of Villanova. Um, from being a part of the process, I've learned about a lot of the efforts on campus to bridge any gap between students with and without disabilities. Um, but there is still definitely room for progress. Um, and there are so many ways for you to get involved. Um, definitely look into Special Olympics. It's hosted here every November. Um, it's a really, really, truly wonderful weekend. Um, but it is still just one weekend out of the entire year. So I encourage you to stop into the Office of Disability Services and ask questions and continue dialogue that we started here tonight. Um, Level, which is the student group run out of that office, um, is fairly new to campus, and so there are so many opportunities for new students to get involved. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say uh, is that if we allow our actions um, in the future to be affected by what we've heard here tonight, then I believe the panel will truly have been a success. Um, so um, on that note, that's all we have for you. Tonight, I hope you're all just as glad and excited as we will happen as I am. Uh, I think we're